Yeah, thanks, Annie, and good morning, everyone, and thanks again for the, the, the very good turnout. Um, I'd like to introduce Stephen Davey. CV, Stephen um, graduated with a BSc Geology and a BSc Honours here at UCT in the Cape and started his career in, in the old rocks, Barberton Greenstone Belt with Anglovile exploration, and then gradually, gradually moved through geological time, he says, to the Bushveld complex with Impala, and then Mesozoic and tertiary rocks in Argentina and Ecuador with Gencor and Billiton. Um, he, he then ran out of geological time in 1999 when the Gagu uh, Pinchicha um, volcano that overlooks Quito and Ecuador erupted and he sent me a gorgeous picture looking out of his um, front balcony at this erupting volcano. Um, like many of us, he also had a, a mid-career um, crisis or transition, as he calls it, and came back to, to Cape Town to do a Master's of in Environmental Management. From there, worked for the city of Cape Town and, and in Voto, and then discovered that there are actually quite a few mines, mostly um, industrial mineral deposits being mined here in the Western Cape, and he's going to talk to us about that today. And he's also very up to speed with um, a lot of our legislation and can tell us you know, how and why um, certain permitting processes and other processes don't work. And I think Henny, Henny and Peter for Niekirk are on, on both on the talk today, very interested to hear about that, given their challenges with cutting reeds in the Onrus estuary. Thanks, Stephen, look forward to your talk. Okay, let me just try and uh, share my screen first. Right, is that fine? Can everybody see that now? Yeah, you're good to go. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for, for attending this talk. Um, maybe just as a follow-up from last week's talk about uh, the usefulness of the old material, um, when I got back into mining, which I never actually expected uh, in the Western Cape, the first thing you do is you go to your local geological survey or Council for Geoscience, and there I was really very well helped by Dr. Doug Cole. Every question that I asked, he was always very helpful, provided me information, access to reports, and so on. So I sort of went on a bit of a rediscovery of my own province, um, and uh, thank, thanks to the Council for Geoscience for all the information that they gave me. I also learned a lot more about mining than I ever expected, being involved with uh, mining permit applications, mining right applications, section 102 applications, uh, prospecting applications, assisting people to object to mining applications, all these things that I never actually expected. When, when I came back to the Western Cape, I thought I might not ever see a mine again, but uh, uh, very interesting actually in the Western Cape. So my new stomping grounds stretch from right up the West Coast, almost in the Northern Cape. This is not construction material. This is the Stienkamp's Kral uh, Monazite mine, rare earth mine. And people have been asking a few questions, I think in the previous two weeks about Stienkamp's Kral. Um, They've got a very up-to-date website. So, you know, I'm not going to talk about it, but I would just advise people just look at their website. I think there's a YouTube video on it. Uh, if you know of anybody that wants to invest in rare earth minerals, uh, I think they are looking for investors. Um, so that's a uh, stem come scroll. Um, and then I go as far east, almost uh, to the Eastern Cape. Um, this is the Robert Quarry in Plettenberg Bay, and it in, in fact, it's very close to the turn off to the Robberg Peninsula Nature Reserve, um, but people don't really notice it because it's got very well constructed berms, um, it's tucked away on top of the hill. Uh, the quarry is mining Table Mountain Group sandstone and quartzite, and it's probably the best uh, aggregate anywhere along the garden route. So this is just a picture just to illustrate that uh, 
when you build something, the building material is not always right where you expect it. And here's a picture from Vincent van Gogh. And obviously they needed sand somewhere and uh, they didn't have the sand where they needed it. So here they are um, unloading um, sand off sand barges. So my talk is not going to be a very technical talk. And these are the kind of topics that I would like to try and cover. Um, I believe that geologists have got a lot more to contribute to the environment and to planning than sort of really appreciated. Um, and we're going to be looking at some aspects of construction materials in the Western Cape. Um, and then how the planners look at the Western Cape and a little bit of a case study, and then maybe some room for some discussion afterwards. So here's a, here's a picture um, just to illustrate where I live in, in Darling. Um, and it follows up from some of our previous talks with a little bit of a West Coast influence. This comes from the uh, field guide before the IGC Congress in 2016 from uh, Stellenbosch. The university geologists have done a lot of work on Cape Granites. And uh, there's Darling and the little red A-type granite rocks is, is a little copy outside Darling that I thought was quite handy to use for the name of my consultancy, Flipburg. Um, and also here's the Colenso Fault that previous speakers have spoken about, uh, which subdivides the Tigerberg terrain and the Swatland terrain in, in, um, in the Malmesbury group. Um, people haven't often seen what the Colenso Fort looks like. So I, I, I went out last week and quickly took a few photographs. Um, this is in, in the fields just to the north of Darling, the outcrop, out, out one of the few outcrops where the Colenso Fort can, can be seen. Um, surrounded by flowers and uh, fields of canola. You probably see all the bee boxes all around the, the outcrop as well. I tr tried to get a little bit closer, but not too close because my, my drone, I think, had stirred the bees up a little bit and they were getting a little bit aggro. <laughs> but you can see multiple veining episodes of quartz um, in, in the outcrop here of the Colenso Fault. This is just another illustration. I see John's on the call, uh, John Compton. But you know, quite often when you talk about the environment, the discussion is pretty much dominated by the biodiversity people, the botanists, ecologists. But you know, geological processes are very important when you look at uh, planning. And this is a really nice illustration from John Compton's book, The Rocks and Mountains of Cape Town illustrating the longshore sand movement around the Cape Town area and up the west coast. Um, also, the two islands, Robin Island and uh, Dasson Island, where you've got a, a shadow in the swell, and that allows the fine sand to accumulate on the beach. And then you have these really big dune plumes, one at Atlantis and uh, one up at Kielbeck in the West Coast National Park. You know, so geologists definitely have got a tale to tell, you know, we do work in the natural environment and we shouldn't let the conversation only be dominated by ecologists and botanists. This, this is just another little story. Duncan knows this, Duncan Miller knows this area very well. It's a picture of Azerbontain looking from the north towards the south. Um, with the harbour in the background, uh, Gabra Point in the midground, and then the dune of 16 mile, mile island stretching up to the West Coast National Park. Uh, we've been in Darling since 2011, and this dune has moved back, I can measure it on Google Earth, at least uh, 20 metres. This is, this is another picture of the dune, and you can see the pan in the background. It's called a Roy Pan. And obviously, the sea was there once before. But if, if you look at the dune, I think you might agree that the sea is probably heading back to Roy Pan one of these days. 
and um, um, but these are the type of things that geologists can contribute to and um, and should be taken into account by planners. Here's, here's another example um, of 16 mile beach. And uh, would you advise anybody to buy one of these open stands over here? I'm just, I'm just wondering, can everybody hear me? Yes, you're fine. Yeah, okay. Now this is another aspect with, with geology. You know, the, the world is made of all different types of people and everybody's got their own multicolored sunglasses on and they look at the world from a different point of view. Um, this comes from the Northern Miner. So you can see what the geologist might think or the mining engineer might think or the environmental activist might think. And, and so, the, you know, it's not just, a, 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 things aren't just simple. And, and, and sometimes decisions get made almost by who's shouting the loudest, not really by the facts. Um, and, you know, that's just, just a fact of the world. And that's just something that one, one needs to deal with. Um, but, you know, I think it's important that geologists also put the case forward uh, when it comes up in these type of discussions. Now, geodiversity and biodiversity. The biodiversity people, have done a tremendous job. Um, they've probably been off the mark much quicker than, than the geologists, and they've managed to influence legislation, policy, um, um, regulations far more effectively than, than geologists have managed to. But the, the fact of the matter is that the geology underpins the biodiversity. So, so here we have two pictures. On the left is the geological map. Um, and on the right is a map of the national vegetation of South Africa. Um, the national vegetation of South Africa, actually it's a very good book um, and it's available free on the Sandby website. But, but if you look at the vegetation types, you will see that they come, they match almost perfectly with the ge geological uh, units. Here we have um, the Witsand Formation, which is the, the upper sand on the Cape Flats, which contains uh, fragments of, of seashells. Um, and it's mapped on the vegetation map as Cape Flats Dune Strandfold. The other different vegetation types you can see closely match the geology, peninsula, granite, plain bush, and, and so on and so forth. So when the, the national vegetation map was created, the, the actually did recognize that the geology um, provides the nutrients that go into the soil and the, the soil determines, you know, which plants prefer which soil areas. So there's a very close link between uh, geodiversity and biodiversity. And we know this, look at the uh, geochemistry of, of rocks here in the Western, typical rocks that we see in the Western Cape, granites and shales and sandstones. You can see how many greater variety of elements you get in granites and shales compared to the sandstones. The sandstones are almost like a glass bottle, it's basically silica with very little else. Um, the granites and the shales much more variable, and that will also reflect in the trace elements um, in granites and shales. So this is a picture from the Darling area with the Darling granites in the background, um, some vineyards, and uh, and uh, wheat fields. So the cultivated areas are generally overlying the shale and granite uh, areas. This is another very nice example. This is from Matsikama, up near Klava and von Reinsdorf on the west coast. So you can see the upper Nardo sandstone of the Table Mountain group. 
um, and very clearly the different vegetation of, on the Cedarberg Shale. So the link between the geology and the vegetation is actually very clear in a lot of places in the Western Cape. So the Geological Society of London, I think, has been doing a very good job of promoting geology. Um, and they have a, a different theme every year. Um, one year it was carbon. Um, in 2014, it was geology for society. And they, let me just read it, geology underpins the provision of resources for people and industry, delivers a wide range of essential services and helps us understand how we can live more sustainably on our planet. You know, and so it's not only mineral resources, it includes groundwater, it includes uh, hazards, landslides, earthquakes, sinkholes, uh, hennies, rock engineering, slopes, foundations, geoheritage sites, all of these things um, that uh, geology can con contribute towards, uh, you know, making better decisions of planning and environment uh, around, around the world. And I, and I really believe that these, uh, this information is often neglected or not considered as important. Now, kind of moving on to, on to the topic that was advertised, uh, typical construction materials that are used everywhere and in the Western Cape. One example, brick clay. Now, I never knew much about brick clay till I came back to the Western Cape. And now I really, I think bricks are magic. Uh, they really are. The amount of work that goes, goes in, into making bricks, the clay gets taken out of the quarry, um, it gets soured, in other words, weathered naturally for six months. Um, it's blended by the brick maker, put through, put through a mill, and then eventually uh, squeezed out, extruded out, um, and then gets packed into clamp kilns, where ba basically um, the bricks bake themselves. You, you might have seen when you drive past Bot River, the, the brick factory. And then eventually you, you get the bricks and, uh, you know, they've got fantastic properties, durability, um, long lasting, etc. So, you know, it's a really underappreciated um, material, but I, you know, I really think they are magic. Um, then the next thing, which is concrete, and there's a statement that concrete is the world's most consumed resource after water. And so to make one cubic meter of concrete, you actually need 0, 0,6 six cubic meters of sand, and you need 0, 0,6 cubic meters of stone. And this has all got to come from somewhere. Um, Topical materials, here's a stone aggregate. This is uh, crushed stone. This is again from uh, Robert Quarry. Um, Here's an example. The material is building material is all, all around us. Um, and this is just a nice example from Sea Point because you can see the Cape Granite in the background. You can see the Marmesbury Shale on the left hand side, and you can see the capping of uh, Table Mountain sandstone in, in the background. Cape Town essentially was built from Philippi. Um, the dune sand in Philippi was used for all the, the freeway construction in the, when, it, when was it, Charlie Morris in the 60s and, and 70s. And the Philippi sand is almost over. Uh, the very nice thing about Philippi is that once, once the overlying dune sand has been removed, um, it can be rehabilitated to form horticultural fields. And so Philip is the breadbasket of Cape Town, all carrots, lettuces, vegetables, all sorts of things uh, being, being grown, grown there. Oh yes, also the nice cross bedding that you can see in the uh, dune in this picture. Then the other type of sand that's uh, mined around the Cape Town area is referred to often as hillwash sand or colluvial sand. Um, 
And this is generally a bit coarser than the sand from the Philippi area and is quite prized for making concrete, concrete sand. And uh, here's, here's an example near, near Darling. And uh, this is an example of an area that was mined for this exact same type of sand um, between um, Marmesbury and Clippiable. And it's actually been rehabilitated back to wheat fields. You can see Table Mountain in the background. This is now another example of red dune sand that comes up from the uh, Friedendal area in the West Coast. And the thing is, sand is not just sand. There are actually specifications for concrete sand, plaster sand, and mortar sand. And uh, there are tests that need to be done if you want to make sure that your material complies with these standards. Um, and they would typically do a, a sieve analysis for the material through the sieves and um, make sure that uh, material doesn't contain an excess amount of dust or the size is the wrong size fraction. And then they would plot it up on a, on a sort of a graph like this. So you can see from uh, this example, the, the red dune sand up in, in Friedendal does, does not fit in within the envelope for uh, um, concrete sand. It's actually far too fine grained. So it's not really suitable for making concrete. Um, but what they use the sand for up in, in, in the Friedendal area, it's actually just as a filling sand. So when they're working on a site and the site needs to be level, um, then they would use the sand as, as, a, as a filling sand. Now, it's also coming up uh, a topic of renewable energy, energy transition, and so on and so forth. And so there's wind farms being built all over the place. And this photo is just taken of, of West Coast One, which is to the west of Friedenberg. Yeah, you can see the wind farm, but you can also notice that each one has got a concrete area around, around the base. Um, this is a sort of like a little bit of a mini case study from the Lurisfontein wind farm. You can see here they're busy putting a, a base with all the rebar getting ready. You can't have one of these wind turbines falling over. Um, You've got to make sure that the reinforced concrete is, is strong and uh, it's not a trivial amount of concrete that's needed. So for the base of each one of these wind turbines, you need 60 truckloads of concrete for the base. Um, in a concrete mixer, you've got about six cubes. Um, the volume of the, the base is 360 uh, cubic meters. So you would need 216 cubic meters of sand for one base of, of one wind turbine. And this Lurie's Fontaine mm -hmm. wind farm has got six, 61 wind turbines. So they needed 13,000 cubic meters of sand. It's up in Lurie's Fontaine and there actually isn't much suitable sand. Lurie's Fontaine is in the Northern Cape. So this sand was literally exported from the Western Cape to the Northern Cape. If you're looking at a 20 cubic meter uh, uh, link truck, that's 650 truckloads of sand that are being exported or was exported from the Western Cape. So the amounts of material you're looking at aren't, certainly aren't trivial. This is, this is another example. This is a project that was meant to have happened and it hasn't happened so far. Um, there's plants and machinery standing there in Clan William um, and the Department of Water Affairs never seems to have the money to do this job. Um, they put out a tender for the supply of these materials in 2019. They never awarded it, but if you look um, at the quantities that they want. You know, this is even an order of magnitude more than was required for the wind farm. 305,000 tons of sand, 
240,000 tons of larger aggregate and 320,000 tons of a 19 millimeter aggregate. And, um, you know, that's the type of thing you, you think that they should have sorted. Um, as far as I know, there's not a single licensed sand mine anywhere between Stristol and uh, von Reinsdorf. Um, you know, so it's just an aspect that, to me, planning should, should be better. You know, and they should maybe be thinking of alternatives, maybe during the drought. They could have even got sand from the, the bottom of the dam and created some more volume at the bottom of the dam. Okay, we're gonna move over a little bit towards town planning. Now, every municipality has to put together a spatial development framework. And, and you'll see it in these spatial development frameworks, they have the green areas, which they call core areas, and then they have buffer areas, and then they have the urban areas. And most, most of these plans, um, the basic information comes from mapping that was done by Cape Nature and the South African National Biodiversity Institute called um, Biodiversity Spatial Planning Frameworks. Um, and basically the, the, the biodiversity sector got in fast, they made the information available and they made it so easily available that the town planners use it. It's just very simple to, to, for them to use. Um, and that's just the accepted way of doing it. Here's the spatial development framework from your part of the world down there in, in the Overberg. Uh, I had a, had a quick look at it um, the other day. And I skimmed through it and I found the word geology, I did a word search, it's, it's once. The word geology and the word groundwater also is once in the whole Overberg spatial development framework. And if, and if you read through the writing, uh, you'll, you'll see the spatial development framework. Um, and then they refer to the overstrand critical biodiversity and ecological support areas determined by Sandby. So what was provided to them by the biodiversity people is taken as reflecting the natural environment. Um, it is a very good document, but you know, obviously it comes from that particular point of view. If you look at the Western Cape land use planning guideline document, look at all these different activities that they want to plan for conservation, agriculture, land reform, accommodation. They don't make any provision for, for where the materials come from. And a lot of our construction materials in the Western Cape actually do come from, from rural areas. If, if you put in an application away from people, it's, it's actually much better. You know, you're not disturbing people. Um, and uh, a lot of the mines are out of town. So, uh, but the Western Cape government decided to, to, to leave that out. Now, this is another, another document. This comes from the National Department of Environmental Affairs. And they were looking at what are the standards for the consideration of environmental aspects in municipal spatial development frameworks. Um, and when they looked at mining, they didn't really seem to look at anything positive. These are the things they want to look at. Mine tailings, current and past mining areas, acid mine drainage affected features, areas contaminated and degraded by mining. Now, all these municipalities that actually need the materials to build their towns. Now, how come they aren't planning for where do their materials come from? You know. Do the materials come from checkers or <laughs> builder's warehouse? Um, but it's, it's a basic thing that municipalities should make provision for, for where 
is the material coming from that is going to be used to build their towns. The other thing that we're dealing with is that uh, there's so much legislation these days. So you have your national environmental legislation. And if you do, if you do a mining application, you have to remember that it's a dual application. You submit in terms of the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act and simultaneously um, in terms of the National Environmental Management Act. And the National Environmental Management Act has, has got very strict time frames. It uh, uh, requires extensive consultation with stakeholders and interested and affected parties. And these time, time frames are pretty inflexible. So for a small mine or a mining permit, it's a basic assessment is required and that process takes six months. If it's a mining right, it's a full environmental impact assessment and that process takes 12 months. And so that's like the, the limiting factor. So if, if the National Minister of, of Mineral Resources says that they're going to speed up um, their processing. Well, he, he can't actually, because the mining right or mining permit can't be issued until the environmental authorization is granted. Um, so <clears throat> the permission to speed up mining right applications doesn't lie with the Minister of Mineral Resources. It actually depends on the, the, the process of the National Environmental Management Act, and that, that, if, that affects, that's the same for all applications, whether it is a, a mining application or just a normal construction um, municipal type uh, application. And here in the Western Cape, <clears throat> we're also um, affected by laws that might not apply in other provinces, but the municipalities also want mining applications um, to be approved by the municipality. And in some cases on agricultural ground, the, the province also requires a third permission, which is in, for the Provincial uh, Land Use Planning Act. Now, this is uh, a, a totally separate issue. This is a little bit of a case study because the Council for Geoscience has done mapping and, and there's more mapping than we Actually, I realized there's more one in 50,000 maps that have been more made uh, available recently. And in this little sh short case study, they actually handed over the brand new one in 50,000 maps for Sordana Bay, Friedenburg and, and Feldrift to the, to the municipality in, in the Sordana Bay area. Um, even refers to the Colenso Fort, um, and there's proof, there's the map, there's the mayor of Sordana Bay municipality, he's got the map, he's got the CD with the digital copies of the maps, he's, he's got the report. Um, it's actually a very nice uh, document and it was done by Peter Siegfried and uh, Dave Roberts, it's got a lot of detail in it. Um, it's, it's even got geological stops. You could take yourself on your own geo trail. Um, the numbered positions with photographs that you can access, drive around. It's really high quality map. And it was given on a plate to the Sordana Bay municipality. Um, again, we, we go back to the spatial development framework that was drawn up for the municipality. And um, again, it, it's divided into these core areas and the buffer areas, and pretty much de derived from the, the mapping that was provided to them by Sandy and Cape Nature on the Western Cape uh, Biodiversity, Biodiversity Spatial Framework maps. But in, in their document, the town planning document, they've got a section on mining and, and natural gas. Now, if, if you look at it, you'll, you'll see they go back to information that comes from 2007. Um, they have things wrong. They can't spell kaolin. 
they've put phosphorus instead of phosphate. Um, and what's even worse is they've interpreted an area which, which is hashed in purple um, and they call it phosphate. And it covers a huge area. Now, if anybody's read the geological reports, the phosphate deposits are in more discrete areas. So around Elansfontein, there's a deposit, there's another deposit uh, closer to town. Um, but maybe there are occurrences of phosphate in other areas, but it's certainly not wall to wall covered uh, in, in phosphate. And then the, the following map, they draw hazards and impacts. And they've got down here, um, phosphate resource as, as if this is sort of like uh, a major thing that everybody has to be concerned about in Sordana Bay. It's, 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 it's not correct. Um, and, and these town planners, you know, they're meant to be one of the best town planners and, and it's wrong, you know, um, and it con concerns me. And they, and they put putting down mines here um, as, as hazards. Now, the, the quarries that Sordana Bay is built out of, why, sh why should that be a hazard? It can be a very well-managed operation. Um, it can have a fairly confined footprint. Um, and, uh, you know, so I just, I think it's wrong. So, so the importance of planning for essential construction materials, it's often overlooked. And this is by, you know, provincial and local scale um, EIAs and, and planning. Then at last, the Council for Geoscience is making geological maps and explanations available on the CGS website. And then that's something I've been sort of trying to motivate for quite a few years, I've written letters to the Council for Geoscience. I've had a letter published in the journal, in the Geo Bulletin, um, and that <clears throat> is definitely progress. Um, Cam in the Western Cape, we've got a very good website called Cape Farm Mapper. If anybody's interested, it's got all sorts of information on farms all over the Western Cape. It's got cadastral boundaries of properties. It's got water resources, conservation resources, and, and, and uh, Cameron from the, the council managed to get them to put the, <clears throat> the one in one million mapping, which is, which is progress. Um, eventually, it would be nice to even get the one in 250,000 mapping available digitally. Um, in, you know, in England, you can get uh, I, I geology. You've got all the BGS mapping available on your cell phone. Um, and I think we should aim to get our geological information accessible, you know, um, the sooner the better. Um, this, this was a talk that I gave to the IAIA, well, part of it, um, and I was trying to encourage them to get better geological information into plans and policies and, and so on. So I'm just repeating that. Um, but, but, but the converse is, is true, and, and I think Kenny mentioned it as well, you know, in, in geology and mining, there is a trust factor and uh, people can be rightfully concerned about things that have happened in the past and, and also things that are currently happening. This, this is uh, the Tormann operation up the west coast at uh, Hilval Karoo heavy mineral sand operation and uh, you know overmining undermining the cliffs and you have a cliff coll collapse so you know <clears throat> i think when things are done wrong then geologists also need to say that it's wrong um, and maybe not a very clear way to to end it but i just sort of put this up as an example because this is kind of what, what the ecologists and the biodiversity people have done and, and 
how the conversation has been going. And, and so the old Sandy was the South African National um, Bio Biodiversity Institute. And South African National Botanical Institute, which was, you know, a scientific body that would do these type of things, connections, taxonomy, mapping, very serious science. Um, but when South Africa started opening up to the world and they realized that we've got the six floral kingdom and other biodiversity hotspots, they grasped the opportunity and they got money from the Global Environmental Fund. They did botanical and vegetation mapping of South Africa, which they've made available. Um, and they've kind of moved out of just being scientists and have really gone out of their way to um, influence policies and legislation and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, I, I think that if we can, the geologists should also try and, and move out and get the message out and, and influence just, just as much as the, uh, the people in the biodiversity sector have done. Yeah, so I think that's pretty much what I've got to say. I don't know if Penny and Johnny, do you want to start a conversation or? What's next? Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Stephen. That's excellent. Um, I certainly believe there's a whole lot of discussion that will follow from that. So do you want to download your, or, or stop sharing your screen and then we'll open up the discussion? Okay. Um, question time, ladies and gents, who wants to kick off? Any, any questions? Uh, I have a question. Hi, John, go for it. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for that for that very interesting talk. I uh, was it was nice to be brought up to date on things like the Clan William Dam, which I've noticed they've got all of the equipment it looks like there and the cement making stuff. Everything looks good to go, but as you mentioned, nothing's happened, and uh, I am sort of curious if you know what sort of holding, ultimately holding that up, I, I suppose, as you said, it's, it's the money, you know, that they're, they're having trouble raising all the money, but it looks like they're really on the verge of starting. I don't, you know, I don't, it's, it seems like an odd situation there. Um, and then the other, the other thing I just wanted to comment on was the phosphate. Um, I, I think this is very interesting for me as a scientist, because uh, we've often been interested in phosphate, both offshore and onshore. And if you look at the old one and two fifty thousand geological map, they have little spot soil analyses of phosphate in the soil, and it's quite high. Through, and I, I think that's how they defined that whole region that you showed, the hatch, the purple hatched area, was defined on the basis of really quite unusually high phosphate in the top soil samples that they took, uh, I think just sort of random sampling. And it's not a huge number of samples, but that's how they sort of defined it. And then I guess the idea is that there's the potential for phosphate deposits at depth, right? That, that the, um, we don't really know where these phosphate deposits might be. I mean, obviously historically the Chemfoss mine at Longoban Vech, uh, now the West Coast Fossil Park was the big one. And now the Elonsfontein site is potentially going to be developed or has been developed. And I guess there's a sense that there's the potential throughout that area, not everywhere, but through, certainly within that corridor that's maybe sand covered or whatever that may contain uh, deeper, more rich uh, phosphate deposits, which is kind of intriguing. Um, so anyway, those those are just my two comments. So I don't know if you want to follow up at all on the Clan William Dam and what's holding that up, and also any other thoughts on the phosphate. Thank you. 
Uh, with the Clan William Dam, the Department of Water and Sanitation, I think they've spent their money on other projects and uh, they just don't have the funds at the, at the moment. And uh, I understand there's some very frustrated people that are on that project and just sitting around in Clan William waiting for something to happen. Which, uh, uh, Stephen, are you being polite? I understand that that money has been stolen a couple of times. <laughs> no, anyway, Mr. Button. So they, uh, then with the phosphate, actually there's been quite a lot of exploration that was done. Salmon Co um, and various other companies drilled in the Sodana Bay area, you know, as far back as the, the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and so most of the, 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 the deposits that are known are, are known. I think there's one at a place called Baker Island and there's one between Friedenberg and, and Sodana Bay. Um, and uh, one heading out towards Paternostra and, and all the rest. You know, the town planners don't really know the difference between the mineral occurrence and the mineral deposit. So, you know, a small amount doesn't necessarily mean a mine. And so from the available information, <clears throat> there, there are two or three other spots apart from Fontaine and, and the Fossil Park that, that could be looked at, but it's certainly not wall to wall um, sure. covered in, in, in phosphate. You know, and, and, and the other thing is, uh, you know, the, the amount of information that's been obtained, paleontological information from the fossil park, which was a Kempfos salmon core bulletin mine. Nowadays, it's, it's, it's almost as if the mine is not appreciated because if, if there wasn't a mine there, then they wouldn't have been able to find all these amazing fossils at, at the fossil park, you know? So it's sort of like a chicken and an egg. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. And that's when they were uh, very concerned about the Elonsfontein mine, I said, well, who knows? Maybe they'll find another great fossil deposit and it'll help fill some of the paleontological gaps on the West Coast, which might, might be very interesting. But in the end, I, you know, they haven't minded enough yet to know how much fossil material might be there. But I agree with you that the mines are certainly one way to discover, uh, you know, deposits that otherwise never would have been known. Spectacular deposits. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. John Blaine has got his hand up. Oh, thanks, Amy. And uh, Stephen, you know, it was an eye-opener to me, I must say. Uh, the volumes that you quote, that are quoted there for just one wind turbine are just mind-blowing. And it's, uh, you see these things going up in the Karoo, you wonder where all the material is coming from as well. But uh, just two, two main things I want to comment on. The, your very last slide, I think, from Sandby was quite an eye-opener is that unless I really missed it, it was in fine print. Geology underlying absolutely everything in that, in that diagram was missing completely. So uh, that's, uh, that's obviously a glaring error on the part of the geological fraternity and the Council <coughs> for Geosciences, I think are primary, primary culprits. And then I'd just like to quote uh, or, or point out uh, an my uh, my biggest experience of the lack of communication between municipalities and the Council for Geo and Science is up in the Limpopo province at Mokopani, where they allowed the development of an extended township of Mokopani laid out by the municipality right on top of a the one of the original examples of the Platte Reef on the northern limb. Um, subsequently, there was a lot of drilling that went on right through this township. But of course, they could never, this is Ivanhoe, they could never even plan to mine that area because they had to move tens of thousands of people. And even though they went through all the process of, in fact, identifying new ground nearby to, to this is the mining company, to, to relocate these people, that was never going to happen. So as a result, there's a sterilized mineral resource there, which could have been a huge benefit, not only to the community, but to the country which through the lack of planning and communication between the Council for Geoscience and municipalities, which is actually just dead in the water. The, the, only, the, the only positive upshot of that is that Ivanhoe had to drill further down and discovered a completely new deposit further down dip. 
which they now call flat reef, uh, typical Ivanhoe style, which is on the card some stage to be developed. But there is nonetheless a huge near surface open cast resource, which is never ever going to be mined. And I think the, the Council for Geoscience really has to take the blame for a lot of that. No, I agree. The, the municipalities need to take uh, the mineral resources into account. And it, and it seems to be that um, they think that the mineral resources are a national competence. And when it comes to mining, they, they, they're not really interested until the moment that somebody puts in an application and then they suddenly want to control it. Um, but, but they're not taking responsibility for the planning of it. Um, but it's just when you apply, then they want to be in charge. Yeah. How do you suggest we go forward with this? Would we be putting pressure on the town planners to incorporate something like a building factor and saying, look, in the next years, we're going to be using, building so many houses, we'll be needing so, many, so much building materials and maybe put an incentive factor on there, sort of say that, uh, say for instance, sand, you know, if you come with a license and you say, I'm so many miles from, from the source that you actually get a plus. So to put pressure for them to start planning how much the, the volumes are, and then by that means put pressure on geoscience to, to provide that information. Well, how do you see us doing this? Well, you know, I think, you know, obviously in the big picture, ideally you want your council of geoscience to be, be more active and more proactive. But, but you know, on, a, on an individual scale, in an individual municipality, you, you guys are in the overstrand, you know, so, so when these documents come out from the municipality, because I think they have to do a spatial development framework every five years, you know, then it would be worthwhile for the geologists to look at them, you know, and if there are things that are missing or things that are obviously wrong, then that's the ideal moment to, to point it out to the, the, the planners in, in the municipality. Yeah, yeah, Stephen. I mean that's critical, and I think any and John, you know, it, it, it all goes back to raising the profile of the profession. And if you look at us here in South Africa, and I'm on, on my hobby horse, you know, the, the geological profession in South Africa is really tarnished by you know it, it, it's mining, and mining has um, you know made big holes. It does environmental damage. And it kills people. And so the image of mining in this country, and we then get caught up in that backwash, is is actually awful. If you want to be honest about it, um, but, you know. So I think we, as a profession, you know, starting with our professional bodies, um, really need to to look at how we can, you know, turn this around. And obviously, you know, some of that goes back to to geo heritage projects. Um, you know, there's a bunch of people on this talk who are involved in geo heritage. It involves in, in getting school kids involved and you know teaching them the benefits, and and then just just to extend it, and I have I have to leave at eleven, but but um, the, the, it's really good, Stephen, that you brought up the wind farms and John commented on it again too, and you know the the, the, the footprint that's been developed in the Karoo is actually quite frightening. People should drive up to to um, uh, where did we go, Sutherland, John, and see you know what's actually going on there. Um, in terms of you know damage to to the environment, but 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 the other side of it, when you get to climate change, no one no one talks. I, I've yet to see a politician talk about cement, which you Ray, Ray, um, um, mentioned, um, Stephen. And there's a lovely article that was published in the Guardian in 2019, and it says concrete, the most destructive material on earth. You, you know, and, and, and that just gets forgotten about. And if you look at those pictures of Cape Town, um, you know, Cape Town and the flats and um, all of these popular places around the Cape are not going to stop growing. And that needs cement and sand and, and all these other commodities. So this, um, you know, this view of the world that you're going to stop coal mining and you're going to stop, you know, making holes in the ground is just quite bizarre. And, and, you know, if we really want to worry and be concerned about climate change, let's go and look at basic things like cement. You know, cement and manufacturing of cement is just hugely destructive. So that's my tuppence for the day. John, can yes, you John? hear me? Quibus here. Quibus, sorry, let's, let's just get Dylan a quick one and then you, Quibus. Dylan, you can unmute okay. yourself. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen, for the last presentation. Um, 
Yeah, I think, I mean, from what I've seen with uh, a lot of these, um, the tenders for the SDFs and integrated development plans um, are, yeah, the municipal officials that write the terms of reference aren't really educated in terms of geology and hydrogeology and stuff like that. So that's why the, the, the TOR is always written and focused, you know, towards the more ecological, environmental side of things. Um, and that's why the geology and stuff's always left as an, as an afterthought. And that's also, also a factor because the environmental lobby is, is so strong in the country and they always push, you know, it's, it's their prerogative. They, they push what they want to be done. So I think, yeah, I think if the, the geoscience community had a stronger lobbying aspect to it and educational as which has been which has been improved strangely because of COVID you know I was saying I saw John yesterday and I was saying you know there's a lot more access to to geological presentations to the general public now um, when there probably wasn't so much in the past so I think that's an important thing um, and we've learned that from the like various groundwater projects we've worked on that even educating the ecologists and um, botanists themselves on, on geology um, helps them kind of not be so panicked about uh, developments, whether it be mining or uh, groundwater developments or stuff like that. Thanks. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, Gomez? Yeah, I just want to make a, make a comment on, uh, you know, that point of, let's say, geologists being more involved in um, or their input, you know, into town planning. And the one major problem there is that, as I understand it, and I've never gone, you know, let's say to the real sort of bottom it by reading the act and so on. But I think when they established, when they uh, did the um, Council for Geosciences Act, I think the guys there, and I wouldn't mention names or whatever, but the thing is, what they did is they have some sort of a clause there. I think that no other state department may employ geologists. All geologists are that give advice to uh, central government, local, uh, uh, provincial government, and even local mm -hmm. government, I think, are not allowed to be sort of employed geologists. So, because obviously they, it was a sort of, sort of self-preserving type of sort of thing, you know, that they, uh, you know, they wanted to do all their jobs. And so what one find is, you know, where I would think there should be a, Free State and Gauteng and Western Cape or whatever, you know, there should be three, four different types of geologists employed, you know, in the, in the provinces. I think you will all agree with me then there's none. There's not no post for a geologist. I think no one that are actually called or registered as a geologist are actually allowed to be employed in such a position, you know, for a provincial, a local government or a central government department. And I think that is one of our major problems because, you know, as myself, you know, sort of working in engineering geology, <clears throat> let's say for most of my life, you know, uh, we find that all the time, you know, that, I mean, you are speaking to people that uh, almost don't even know that, you know, engineering geology or geology should have an input, you know, into planning and things like that. And uh, obviously how to rectify that in, on a present condition, I don't know. But uh, you know, I fully agree, obviously, with what is said here, and I think that is that uh, you know all these places, you know, I would say Cape Town needs, let's say, at least let's say two or three people giving geological input, and even uh, let's say all these uh, uh, Wolfenbach, perhaps even uh, plus some other, you know, would need let's say one to give input. But at the moment, everything rests on the Council for Geoscience. And uh, I just don't think that, you know, they can handle it. So I think it's a major problem in, uh, in South Africa. Thanks. Thanks, Clovis. Peter van der Kerk, Dr. van der Kerk wants something about water, I hope. No, not water, Henny, but um, I was actually... I can't hear Peter. Sorry. Am my, I unmuted now? My apologies. I, I just want to take your hand down and I actually muted you. Sorry, Peter, just start again. Okay. Uh, no, I said uh, jokingly, I wanted to ask whether wine and geology doesn't come together somehow as well. But uh, more seriously, I've not, you know, many of these talks of, of and I'm an engineer, I come from a, completely from a side 
uh, another side, but listening to you geoscientists and the many very uh, serious issues that you raise, like today with the uh, issue, for instance, of the spatial development uh, that doesn't include uh, uh, geology and the mapping, etc., as you would like to see it. I was wondering whether there isn't a mechanism of entering the information at the right spots or the right places in, 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 at government. Uh, there is, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether the geological sciences uh, is a subset of the um, South African Academy of Sciences, for instance, whether there isn't an avenue through the academy to actually write letters to the president or the minister of the appropriate department and say, this is a serious issue that you have and put it into a, a two or three page there in a succinct form. And then and also to then put it out in the media that, that had been done. This is what we do from the engineering side. We have a South African Academy of Engineering if we feel strongly about something, then we put it down into such a paper and we, we uh, send it to the appropriate uh, politicians uh, and the uh, maybe director generals of the, of the uh, uh, departments that, are, that have to be targeted. So I'm putting this to you and unfortunately John is now not with us any longer, uh, he left, but I would like to think that that is something that uh, the Oberberg Jew scientists may want to follow up on. Thanks, Sini. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Dylan? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think Peter's correct. I mean, we have the GSSA, but I mean, yeah, the GSSA was always, has always been more focused on mining, I think, but I think it's time to change and move towards more pressing uh, issues like, like we discussed here. And then just on what Purvis said, um, the city of Cape Town actually <clears throat> now employs two hydrogeologists, um, or actual city employees, and I think they're the, the, that's the third of its kind in South Africa. And yeah, it does help a lot with, um, uh, they, they have input into all various things, um, groundwater related, but also contamination, et cetera, across, this, across all the various departments in the city. And I fully agree that that kind of stuff, that, geologists as well and engineering geologists that there should be a, a point on a municipal basis um, it would just make things a lot easier i think um, yeah thanks dylan uh, there's a question from julia Hedeman uh, for you stephen asking that uh, is the crushing and milling of stone to produce sand seen as too costly no um that is an option and uh, Doug Cole actually mentioned it in the, because he, he wrote a, a, a Council for Geoscience Bulletin about 2001 on the, the sand in the Western Cape. And he said that eventually um, that is going to be an alternative that we've got to look at is, is manufacturing sand instead of just using natural sand. The thing is that at the moment, uh, manufactured sand probably costs about four times as much as natural sand. So, so obviously, you know, people have a choice they would still go for natural sand, but there is uh, quite a lot of, they call it crusher dust from crushing plants that is, is used. It's used for making like uh, concrete blocks and pavers and uh, material like that. So, so material from crushing plants is, is being used as well at the moment. So it does help keep the natural sand too. So. Uh, maybe just coming here on, on sand, I worked in, in Qatar for seven years and I couldn't believe that they actually import sand. Uh, this is how far they go to protect their natural resources. So they wanted, they didn't want to use their own sand, so they buy sand cheaply from next door. It's just one of those things that if you plan well, you know, you do things like that. I, I'm looking for volunteers to put together for us some kind of paper that we can forward. You guys are sitting there at home. Please think of something. John, you want to say something? Yeah, I think that the, maybe the one thing that, uh, you know, we all think of sand as sand, but sand is not just sand. I mean, there's a big difference between river sand and beach sand. And, and it's not so much, uh, you know, it's, it's the granularity, but also the, 
the um, the shape of the sand fragments, as I understand it, finely polished uh, beach sand is generally not very useful for concrete and cement. Maybe because it's got maybe a lot of limestone, other shell material, and it's difficult to separate. But also wind wind blown sands, I would imagine, are probably not as good as river sands. And uh, so, Stephen, do those aspects come into it as well? That just the type of sand, how useful they are. Oh, definitely. No, no, there's, a, there's a big difference between the uh, different types of sand and, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, they even need to blend sand to make it comply with uh, specifications as well. So, you. so you would find that the quality sand might be not 100% suitable for concrete sand, but if you blend it with some of the Malmesbury type sand, then you can you can get a product that is 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 really good for concrete. So, yeah. Thank you. No, 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 sand is not just sand. <laughs> yeah, just just for the layman amongst us, uh, you know, the, the grading curve looks to try and obviate all the voids and, and minimize that to see the density of what you're going to produce at the end of the and therefore some circular sands leaves too much, too much gap in, in a concrete. Um, therefore, you've got, you've got to design your, you know, and, and the ultimate strength, how long you're going to have the concrete. Guys, any more questions at this point? John, your hand is still up, or is it the previous hand? There we go. Thank you very much, guys. I think this was a very stimulating conversation, and it's not the end of it. We've certainly learned a lot of new things. Thank you very much, Stephen, for, for, for doing this for us. And guys, yes, sorry. What? Can I talk, uh, Fede? Mark, Mark, sir. John. Carry on. John or myself? Whoever speaks now. Close. Okay. I, I just saw something there from Debbie Ayn. I suppose that is Debbie Abel from uh, from Durban. She just says that they've got an engineering geologist uh, at, at the Quinney. Uh, that's quite correct. I mean, I know them all, starting from, I think, Tim Francis about 40 years ago. And uh, But that's about the only one that I know of. And I don't know if he's appointed... Uh, if they are appointed, let's say, according to, you know, the regulations of Council for Geoscience, because uh, I would say that's about the only city that employs uh, engineering geologists as such. I mean, in Victoria, for example, or Tuani, we've got one there called Ashika Sudu, but I think Ashika Sudu is there under another sort of name, under, let's say, a geotechnical officer or something like that, not as a geologist, uh, you know, per se. So uh, yeah, so that's just the answer on uh, you know on uh, you know on that one. I think just the other thing that I would like to ask uh, Stephen, if possible, because I'm quite interested in that, is what what is the main source of uh, crush? Uh, yeah, also nice to see one guy that I know, uh, Peter Pankerk there, <laughs> but uh, from previously from Water Affairs. But uh, what is the main source of uh, say, let's say crushed aggregate? A coarse crush aggregate in the sort of Western Cape, uh, Western Cape area. Is it uh, Table Mountain sandstone, or is it Table Mountain sandstone generally too soft, or what have happened to the Malmesbury Hornfels or shale? No, no. Because that used to have the problem with the alkali aggregate reaction. Just perhaps uh, if anyone knows something about that, uh, you know, I'd, I'll be interested. You know, the, in Cape Town, the main source is Malmesbury Hornfels. Uh, there's a whole series of quarries around the Tiger Big Hills uh, and Efremat and uh, um, uh, Lafarge and, and uh, uh, private company Chioli Brothers, they're all around the Tiger Big Hills. That, those are, so that for Cape Town itself, that is the, the main source. Going up to Sordana Bay, it's more granite, Cape granite, and then I, I think there's a table mounted sandstone quarry in Grabo, and um, going along the garden route, um, table mountain sandstone in uh, in Plittenberg Bay, and then there are quite a few quarries that are, are crushing uh, in on conglomerate, um, sort of like Marshall Bay, Hartenbos area. Yeah. Uh, Stuart Clay. You can unmute yourself, Stuart. Stuart, you got your hand up. Here I am. 
Yeah, okay, here I am. Um, yes, talking about quarries, I was wondering about the potential for ornamental stone with the cake granite. Um, I can't think of any ornamental stone quarry or sales of cake granite as ornamental stone. Most of the ornamental stone for kitchen tops and so on that we find is is imported or it's from the bushveld, the so-called Rustenburg granite, which is gabbro and orite. Oh, there's, there's one quarry on the Paul granite. I think it's called Cliff Quarry, something like that. I can find the reference to it. And then there is also a dimension stone that comes from the Northern Cape. Um, but uh, yeah, not pretty much in the Western Cape. If I could just ask you something. Uh, yeah, okay. What happened to that? Uh, I used, I actually went to school at but I used up to stand at six or what is now grade eight. Uh, and oh, long after I left, they opened a, apparently a marble quarry between uh, Vereinsdorp and Friedendam. Is that for dimension stone or is that from, for some other purpose? It's for it's Cape, Cape, Cape Lime has a, a quarry board is where you mentioned between Friedendam and, um, and Vereinsdorp. But you know, I think they use that for agricultural and uh, industrial purposes. Uh, okay. So there was a marble stone quarry there when I was a geologist in that area. They were trying to make it headstones at the time uh, for graveyards and so on. Um, Debbie, can I ask you to be in touch with us, with uh, put us in touch with that guy in Durban or the person in Durban? So because we would like to take this thing forward locally with the Wolfers Trust. I think we're going to push from ward committee side so that the office trunk can start incorporating geology into their fu future planning we must keep yeah, this I, thing more practically guys i am the person are you the person can you can you maybe put us together just a bit of paper uh, okay. you know, on, on this thing just to see how you know, to explain what your role is and how you how they benefit from your services so that we can you know give us a selling point that we can start putting some pressure on overstrand okay thank you very much okay guys i think we're running a little bit over time now is there any more questions for Stephen? thank you Stephen, and we see you guys next thursday then bye-bye everybody <clears throat>